Your Majesty, Excellencies, Ministers, past and present, Your Excellency, Mr. Speaker, sir, ladies and gentlemen, it truly is an honor that has been bestowed upon me to be given the opportunity of delivering this lecture in the presence of His Majesty. I'm deeply grateful to His Majesty for doing me this honor. I'm also very grateful to the project coordinator and others concerned for having brought me to this beautiful building which houses the Royal Institute of Governance and Strategic Studies. I don't imagine that there is any other institute in the world which combines governance with strategic studies. And I think that illustrates the very special nature of the Bhutanese state, which is devoted to the concept of gross national happiness. For the best strategy to protect a nation is to ensure that its people are well governed and therefore happy. And this unique combination of governance with strategic studies, I think illustrates the unique character of the Kingdom of Bhutan. So it's a double honor to be here. I don't know much about strategic studies, so I leave that uh, to others who are more expert in fighting wars and defending themselves to come and speak to you about strategic studies. What I do know something about as a citizen of India is that we are not well governed. And we have to ask ourselves, how is it that we can so dramatically improve our governance systems in India as to make the people feel that they are the beneficiaries of democracy and not just the victims of democracy? For if you look around the country in almost any class, people will express to you more dissatisfaction than satisfaction with the way things are going. And that, I think, is the reason why we have such frequent changes of government. And the, uh, the person with the lowest mortality is a member of parliament because the chances of getting re-elected only fall to about one-third of our parliamentarians. Two-thirds get rejected in the subsequent election. And this is because there is a prevailing sense, a pervasive sense, that things are not quite as they should be. And it is to respond to this sense of not being fully satisfied that I have chosen the subject that I have today which is democracy from parliament to the grassroots. Let me begin having, uh, having uh, explained what's wrong with my country, but also attempting to put in perspective the one thing that is really right with my country, and that is democracy. For when we became independent in 1947, the total membership of the United Nations was 51, and India under the British had become a founding member of the United Nations. Today, there are 198 members of the United Nations. In other words, since we became independent, approximately 150 nations have come to liberation of one kind or the other and been admitted as sovereign member states of the United Nations. And of these 150 countries, ours is perhaps the only one to have begun as a democracy, to have sustained that democracy, and as far as we can see, to be, have the capacity to remain a democracy into an indefinite future. This was not anticipated when we became independent. Winston Churchill dismissed our leaders as men of straw and predicted that there would be chaos the minute the British withdrew. 
I think there was a great deal of apprehension in several other quarters that we would not be able to last as a country because we were such a diverse nation. There were also forces within the country that were attempting to replicate the first partition of India into other partitions, and there were forces from outside that were attempting to subvert us. And we had the curious experience of sending two ambassadors in quick succession to Moscow and the Soviet Union, the leader of the Soviet Union, refused to ever receive our first two ambassadors, saying you're not really independent, you are a bourgeois democracy that remains still a stalking horse of world imperialism. Yet the fact of the matter is that we became a democracy and remained a democracy. And when we became a democracy, we became a full-fledged democracy in the sense that we had universal adult suffrage and along with that, affirmative action for those sections of our society which had been historically depressed and discriminated against. This question of the universal suffrage is one that bears thinking about for a moment. In the United Kingdom, the Industrial Revolution began in 1760 or so. And by 1832, they had, they'd had as much experience of the revolution as we have had in India today. But it was only in 1832 that the Catholics were given the vote. And it took another 35 years or so for people without property to receive the vote in 1867. And it was not till 50 years after that that half the population of the United Kingdom, the women of the United Kingdom, got the right to vote. In France, they had a revolution in 1789 with the slogan, liberty, equality, fraternity. Now fraternity means brotherhood, and so they forgot their sisters. In consequence of which, the French woman got the vote only after the Second World War. And in the United States, it was declared in 1776 that every human being has the right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. And then there was a little asterisk. It never got written down at the bottom of the Constitution, but it did say, except Red Indians and Negroes. So all the population of the United States that was not white and that was not Christian was really just deprived of the vote. And in that led to the Civil War. And in 1863, President Abraham Lincoln proclaimed the emancipation of the slaves. But that proclamation remained a dead letter for 101 years until in 1964, President Lyndon Johnson succeeded in passing the Civil Rights Bill and thus the American black succeeded in getting his civil rights, the right to vote and the right to stand in elections. So when you consider this background among those democracies which regard themselves as the mother of all democracies or the father of all democracies, and look at the Indian record, where on day one it was decided that since our society, our religion, our religious system had so severely discriminated against those who were called the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes, we must open up special avenues for these categories of our population through affirmative action. And subsequently, a few years later, this was extended also to those who are called the other backward castes. And the Constitution of India made several special provisions for the religious minorities, particularly in respect of their personal law, as well as in respect of their education and their educational institutions. So India, in as soon as it became free, 
decided that it was going to be a full-fledged democracy and that this full-fledged democracy would find expression in the institution of parliament in the nation's capital, Delhi, and in the capitals of each of the states, there would be a state assembly. Now, this meant that we had, between 1947 and uh, the late 1980s, we had about 500 elected members, 542 elected members of the lower house in parliament, and then indirectly elected some 250 members of the upper house. And in all the state assemblies put together, we had about 4,500 elected representatives, making a total of approximately 5,000 elected members. But the population of the country was getting close to a billion. And today, it's estimated that the population of India is probably about 1.27 billion. Now, 5,000 people to represent 1.27 billion people means that the gap between those who are the electors and those who get elected is so wide that the vacuum gets filled by party workers who function as power brokers. They're the ones who are living in the slums, in the towns, in the villages, and they go to the elector and they say, if you want something done by your member of parliament or your MLA, that's the member of the state assembly, then you let me know and I'll pass on your message to him. And in exchange, there was usually some kind of a consideration. And therefore, our democracy, instead of being responsive to what the people wanted, became a democracy that was effectively being driven by the power brokers. And I, took, I think it took immense courage and some foolhardiness on the part of Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi to seize the occasion of the centenary celebrations of the Indian National Congress in Mumbai in December of 1985 to severely identify and criticize the power brokers who were in fact sitting in front of him. And he said, we must move away from this system. Although I think back in 1985, it wasn't very clear to him what was the alternative system that he should be putting in place. But the one theme that went running through his mind since before he even became a politician, and certainly since before he became prime minister, was that the biggest deficiency in our system of administration was that the administration was unresponsive to the needs of the people. That development and welfare were being delivered to the people rather than exercised as a right by the people themselves. And any such bureaucratic delivery system was likely to be arbitrary, that those who were closer to the power brokers were likely to get these development and welfare benefits more quickly and more efficiently, while those who were distanced from the power brokers which effectively means those who are poorer and therefore most in need are the ones who are served last or perhaps not served at all. And that this was the root reason why people were expressing themselves through dissatisfaction rather than through satisfaction. And therefore one needed to work out some method by which this distant, alienated administration could be brought much closer to the people. And ruminating over this, 
he arranged to meet with every single district collector in India. In our country, the head of the district administration is sometimes called a collector, sometimes called a district magistrate, and sometimes called a deputy commissioner. And what Rajiv did was, he convened five meetings of these district uh, heads <coughs> and conducted intimate discussions with them as to what is the major systemic change that can be made which would result in the administration moving closer to the people. And it was my great good fortune to be working with Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi while he was undertaking this exercise. So I attended all the five conferences and I listened very carefully and contributed to some extent to the opening or the closing speech that he made on these occasions. And I think it was at the fourth such conference in Jaipur on the 30th of April, 1988, that he finally hit upon the formula as to how to bring our democracy closer to the people. What he said was that for a, for a responsive administration, it has to be an administration that is responsible not to the minister in Delhi or in the state capital, but to the people themselves in the villages where they live or in the slums where they live. That in order to get a responsive administration, you have to have a responsible administration. And that the only way of getting a responsible administration is to make it a representative administration. Now, out of this flowed the idea that Mahatma Gandhi had been right and that Jawaharlal Nehru, 10 years into his prime ministership, had also been right in attempting to found our democracy not on parliament and the state assemblies, but on grassroots democratic institutions. And here he said on a later occasion, but it's a perception that I would like to share with you, he said 40 years after India had become independent that we may be the world's largest democracy, but we are the world's least representative democracy. For, he said, how can 5,000 people represent a billion citizens? It just can't. And that therefore, it was necessary to supplement the elected bodies in parliament and the state assemblies with these elected grassroots institutions. And given the sheer size of the country, it became necessary in rural India, I'll come to urban India in a minute, in rural India to set up a three-tier Panchayat Raj system. One where there was a local government at the village level, then local government at a level somewhere between the villages and the uh, district, which we usually took as either the block or the taluka. And third, to have above this, a panchayat at the district level. So a three-tier system was devised actually inherited from the past but revamped. And it was said that at all three levels, we will have elected representatives. And the theme went on to say that to these elected representatives would be devolved the power to administer. Usually, when you talk about getting work done at the grassroots level, the expression used in the literature is decentralization. 
What decentralization really means is that the power remains with me, but I give it as an act of charity to somebody below me. Whereas devolution means that the power is taken away from me and given to the person who's going to operate those powers at the grassroots. So the Indian system or the Rajiv Gandhi system was based not on decentralization but devolution. And then said Rajiv Gandhi in what was perhaps his most important perception, that isn't it extraordinary that the greatest Indian of the 20th century, Mahatma Gandhi, wanted our democracy to be based on Panchayat Raj and failed. And the second greatest Indian of the 20th century, his grandfather, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, became an ardent advocate of Panchayati Raj in the last seven years of his life, but he too had failed. And thinking over this, he said the reason they failed is that they didn't spot that we've become the world's biggest democracy by including provisions in the Constitution for Parliament in New Delhi and for the state assemblies. But we haven't made appropriate provision in the Constitution for panchayats, elected bodies, at the grassroots level. And therefore, his initiative did not lie in thinking up this idea of Panchayat Raj, for it had existed as part of our freedom movement, not even in implementing it through the law, because that is what Jawaharlal Nehru tried. And after he died, it just withered on the vine. But by saying that we should give to our local bodies the same constitutional status, the same constitutional sanction, and the same constitutional safeguards as we have given to our parliament and to our state assemblies. And thus, his contribution lay not just in understanding the significance of Panchayat Raj, but in amending the constitution to bring into the constitution the same kind of status, sanctity, sanctions, and safeguards as were available to the other institutions of democracy in the country. This was an effort that he put into motion in the last year of his, uh, of his uh, period as prime minister. This was after he had interacted with every single district magistrate of India through those five conferences, which were held between December 1987 and June 1988. He then remitted his ideas to a committee of parliament, which was in fact headed by the, uh, a member for Arunachal Pradesh, Western Arunachal Pradesh, and thereby brought in the marginalized sections of our society as being critical to operating this system. And then came the legislation after separate meetings with women who had served in the panchayats, with scheduled caste members who'd served in the panchayats, with scheduled tribe members who'd served in the panchayats, to answer the fundamental objection that the founder of our constitution, Dr. Ambedkar, had to Gandhi's proposal for the inclusion of Panchayat Raj in our democratic structures. And that objection was that whereas Gandhi, said Dr. Ambedkar, romanticizes the villages of India, he himself saw the villages of India as cesspools, as stagnant, as reactionary, as oppressive, as, and therefore, any attempt to have democratic institutions at the grassroots is likely to be subject to elite capture. So this was the single biggest problem that faced Rajiv Gandhi as he attempted 
to work out a system whereby there would be representative democratic institutions of, at the grassroots level. And the answer he found was in reservations. First and foremost, for women. He said that our single biggest human resource asset in our villages is our women. And he explained this. He said that the best finance ministers we have in India are the wives of the poorest households who somehow have to make ends meet, however limited the means. And it's amazing, he said, that millions of poor households are run by illiterate women who have performed the task of making ends meet, which he said my finance minister is incapable of doing. So he said, why aren't we using this asset to husband the resources that we will make available to the local governments at the grassroots level? And so he devised a system of reserving 30% of the seats as well as 30% of the posts for women. Now that eventually got changed to 33% before the legislation was passed. And then the government of Bihar under Nitish Kumar was the one which said, why 33%? Since women constitute half the population of the country, indeed of the world, they deserve to have half the positions in the panchayats and raise the reservations for women from 30% and 33% to 50%. And now, as many as 15 states of the Union of India have followed that example, and we have 50% reservations in 14 of these 15 states, and in your neighbor, Sikkim, the percentage of reservations for women is 40%. And legislation has been passed by the upper house of parliament, but not yet by the lower house of parliament, that this should be made universal, and that everywhere in India, for local government, 50% of the seats and 50% of the posts should be reserved for women candidates. The flaw, as we have discovered in, in, in practice, is that the Constitution did not specify what would be the periodicity of the rotation of reservations. So in most states, you have women having seats reserved for them for only one term. And just about the time that they have acquired the experience to be able to effectively exercise power, the next elections come and they lose their reservations. I think to ensure that it is more successful, we should follow the example of Chief Minister Jayalalitha of Tamil Nadu, who has made it a two-term reservation. And I would recommend a three-term reservation so that over a period of three terms, 15 years, the ladies who've been elected acquire the experience and the self-confidence to easily be able to win even unreserved seats, general seats. How successful has this operation been? Number one, whereas we used to have 5,000 elected representatives in India. As a result of Rajiv Gandhi's in initiative, the number of elected representatives in India, including those at the grassroots, is, please hold your breath, 3.2 million. There are 32 lakh elected representatives in our country. And of these, 
approximately 14 lakh are women. We have 14 lakh elected representatives who are women. And of these, approximately 86,000 hold office as president or vice president of their respective local governments. This is political and social empowerment of women on a scale that is without precedent in history and without parallel in the world. And yet, tragically, this is not much known. Leave alone abroad is not known in India. Prime ministers address foreign parliaments and forget to mention these 14 lakh elected women representatives, these 86,000 women who are running their panchayats. It is gender empowerment of a kind that has never been seen before. At the same time, we have reservations for the scheduled castes in proportion to their share of the population in every village panchayat of India. In other words, if in village A, 20% of the population is scheduled caste, then 20% of the seats are reserved for the scheduled caste. But if 60% of the population is scheduled caste, then 60% of the seats are reserved for the scheduled caste. And this is true at every level, the village level, the intermediate level, and the district level. And at the same time, 33% of the seats of the chairmanships are reserved for the scheduled caste. So they are assured not only of membership in these elected local institutions, but also assured of running about one third of the panchayats of India, thereby meeting Dr. Ambedkar's argument that these will be cesspools of discrimination. On the contrary, in a very large number of them, it is the scheduled caste president who is running the village. Under him are operating very high caste members of the same panchayat. And when it comes to the scheduled tribes, we have two categories of them. There are those who live in what are called the scheduled areas. That is, those parts of India where there is a large tribal population, and that area has been notified as a scheduled area. And those tribals who live outside scheduled areas, where they tend to be in a minority. Where they are in a minority, the same provision applies as applies to the scheduled castes, that if their share of the population of a certain panchayat area is 5%, then 5% of the seats are reserved for them. If it happens to be 20%, then 20% of the seats are reserved for them. And there's also rotation, which ensures that there could be scheduled tribe presidents in areas where the scheduled tribes are in a minority. And for the scheduled areas, that is those areas where the scheduled tribes are in a majority, there there is a special law enacted by parliament under the authority of the constitution called the Panchayats Extension to Scheduled Areas Act 1996, <coughs> generally referred to by its acronym PESA. And here, very special privileges are accorded to scheduled caste representatives and scheduled caste, caste communities and scheduled caste habitations that are not readily available to the generality of our population. And interestingly enough, the women particularly who belong to the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes are take, especially of the scheduled castes, but also of the scheduled tribes in non-scheduled areas, 
are taking greater advantage of this devolution of power than their sisters from the higher castes. Now, this was completely unanticipated. And the proof of it is that in Karnataka, I'm just taking an example because I have the figures. In Karnataka, whereas there is a quota of 33% for scheduled caste women within the overall quota of 33, of whatever percentage it is for the the share of scheduled caste women in the total scheduled caste uh, members who've been elected went up to 54%. So there's 33% reservation, but their actual presence is more than half at 54%. And for the scheduled tribes, even more staggeringly, instead of 33% reservations for scheduled tribe women within the scheduled tribe quota, the actual share turned out to be 65% or double what was intended. And in village after village we found that poorer women, women of lower classes, lower castes, were getting elected in significant numbers. Whereas Dr. Ambedkar and several others had feared that there would be elite capture of these institutions, we increasingly found that it was precisely the women whom we expected to have oppressed the system who were most liberated by the system. And if you thought about it for a minute, the explanation is perhaps self-evident, that the poorer the woman, and in India, therefore, the lower her caste, the more likely is it that her husband would not be living in the village, but would have gone for work outside the village. And so she has to manage the economy of the family and has got used as part and parcel of her normal living to be out in the public space and to interact with men. So when the opportunity of fighting an election comes, an upper caste woman wonders whether she should be wandering the streets of the village, asking unknown men to vote for her, whereas the lower class woman, having experienced already this interaction with anonymous males, takes to political life with greater zeal and zest than the upper class woman. This is a form of empowerment which was not envisaged, but which has come as an, a very special spin-off benefit that women in India have attained. And I think it is because Panchayati Raj has been most beneficial for rural women belonging to the lower classes and the lower castes that people in urban India, and particularly the intelligentsia, know nothing about Panchayati Raj. They want to see more women in parliament. Well, even if you got half the members of parliament as women, that number would be approximately 250, about 275. So what is the importance of 275 women compared to 1.4 million women? Well, the difference is that these 275 women would tend to be rich and of the upper echelons of our society, and therefore the ones that you would meet at cocktail parties and at dinners. And it's they who complain that the women are not empowered in our country, whereas if you happen to go into any village in the country, there's a very high chance that the president of that panchayat would be a woman and would be a poor woman and a less educated woman. And yet, she is exercising the authority of being the president of a panchayat and elected official of that panchayat. So in these circumstances, I think there is a need to drill below the crust. Many 
Indians, if you ask them, many Indians like me, if you ask them, would tell you that this is all a farce, that while the woman gets elected, it's actually her father or her son or her husband who's running the show. And uh, that these women are just there in order to put their thumb imprint on the accounts and that the show is actually run by the men. Now, actually, that's true, but only true at the beginning. And I learned this the hard way as Minister for Panchayat Raj. As Minister for Panchayat Raj, I visited about 150 villages in different parts of India. And on one occasion, I was in Rajasthan, where the president of the village panchayat was a middle-aged woman. And she was answering the questions that I put to her with great competence. When, after I posed yet another question to her, some man standing in the audience intervened to give the answer. So I turned sharply on him and said, I didn't ask you. I was asking her. I want her answer. I then asked my next question. And once again, this man took it upon himself to answer my question. So I scolded him, saying, who are you? And the village started laughing. And one of them then said to me that he is her husband. So I said to the man, I said, it's your wife who got elected, not you. And she seems to be an extremely competent person. Why are you taking it upon yourself to answer these questions when she's quite capable of responding herself? And the lady then looked at me with very sad eyes. And she said, Minister, my husband and I have been married for nearly 50 years. We've brought up our family together. We built our house and our life together. We've helped each other all the time. And now I've been given a new task. It's the first time I'm doing it. Why do you object to his helping me do my work? And I was completely shut up. Because at that moment, I realized that I have never fought an election without my wife at my side. And she is my treasurer during the course of the elections. And she's the one who provides me the advice. And she's the one who acts as a filter between those who want to trouble me and me. And if I depend so much upon my wife in order to run my life, what gives me the authority to tell this woman that she's wrong in listening to her husband? So I think we need to look at these things in a more rounded way and not jump to easy conclusions. There is an expression particularly prevalent in Uttar Pradesh called the Sarpanch Pati, the husband of the Sarpanch. And it is alleged very widely that everything is done by the Sarpanch Pati and not by the Sarpanch herself. But that's because if you run an inefficient panchayat system and convert the sarpanch's office into such a powerful one that you don't have panchayat raj but have sarpanch raj and one individual becomes the power broker at the village level then of course you would have the system of the sarpanch pati more widespread than elsewhere but that's the fault of the system it's not the fault of the woman and not even the fault of her husband. You need to have a truly democratic system. And the beginning of that truly democratic system is not the elected representatives, but the electors who have elected these representatives. And so, although often the expression we use is that we have a three-tier panchayat system, we actually have a four-tier panchayat system. For the base is the Gram Sabha, or the village assembly. And in theory, those who've been elected are held responsible 
by the electors in the Gram Sabha. It is there that they ask the questions, and it is there that they seek the answers, and it is there that they evaluate the performance of their elected representatives, and it is there that they decide whether to give a given elected representative <coughs> the opportunity of serving again, or whether to defeat him or her. So unless you have a very strong Gram Sabha, I don't think you can have an effective panchayat system. For in Delhi or in the state capital, you have an elected government, but that government is responsible to parliament or it's responsible to the state assemblies. Whom are these elected representatives at the grassroots to be responsible to? Not to themselves. They have to be responsible to the beneficiaries. And therefore, <coughs> a very well-established, strong, local parliamentary system is necessary to ensure the success of local government. Now, according to our constitution, the subject of Panchayat Raj is not a subject that appertains to the central government in the central list. It's a subject that has been handed over exclusively to the states. And the states are the ones who are supposed to run the panchayat system. So ultimately, the constitution can prescribe that there must be elected panchayats at the three levels. And it can prescribe that elections shall be regularly held under the supervision of independent state election commissions. But it cannot prescribe how to empower these elected institutions with genuine functions, adequate finances to undertake those functions, and a bureaucracy, functionaries, who would assist the elected representative in running the government. So the process of devolution consists of the three Fs, functions, finances, and functionaries. And it's only if all three of these come together that you get genuine empowerment. And until there's genuine empowerment, you cannot hold them responsible. What happens in many of our village assembly meetings, Gram Sabha meetings, is that the president of the village panchayat listens to the complaints and says, yes, I'll inform the district education officer, I'll inform the district health officer, I'll inform the PWD, I'll inform the district sanitation inspector. He doesn't have any powers. He doesn't have any money. And he has nobody working for him. So what he does is become an intermediary between the bureaucracy and the people. And that is not what Panchayat Raj is about. So we have to have the effective devolution. And effective devolution can only come about by selecting subjects for devolution and ensuring that the three Fs, functions, finances, and functionaries, are devolved to the lower tier of the elected system. I give you an example to illustrate what I mean by the devolution of the three Fs. We have five kinds of roads in India, and I expect that this will be readily understood by a Bhutan, embassy, by a Bhutan audience. We have national highways. Second, we have state highways. Third, we have major district roads. That is, those roads that cross the entire district. Then fourth, we have other district roads that cover a part of the district. And fifth, we have village roads and village link roads. Now, in a proper system of Panchayat Raj, the national highways would be the responsibility of the national government. The state highways would be the responsibility of the state government. But the major district roads 
would be the responsibility of the district panchayat. And the ODR, the other district roads, would be the responsibility of the intermediate panchayat. And the village roads, and the link roads from the village to the main roads, would be the responsibility of the village panchayat. This is what we mean by devolving functions. At the same time, there's money available for the major district roads, the other district roads, and the village roads. If you took an example of 100 crore rupees, just giving an illustrative number, and say that, say 60 crore, or say, no, I think it's better to say 50 crore. 50 crore will go for village roads because they have to be divided, the sum, between a larger number of entities. That will leave you with 50 crore, of which perhaps 20 crore should go for the other district roads, and 30 crore should be kept for the major, the major district roads. Now, that 30 crore should go directly to the district panchayat. The next lot of 20 crore should go to the intermediate panchayats within the district. And 50 crore should be divided among the villages to be able to perform their duties. And as far as the functionaries are concerned, perhaps the superintending engineer should be allotted to the district panchayat to help build the major district, build and maintain the major district roads. The executive engineer should work with the elected representatives of the intermediate panchayat to help look after the ODRs. And the junior engineer should be given a group of villages to help them technically make and maintain the village roads and the village link roads. Now this can be replicated in every field, in education, in health, in sanitation, in irrigation, in the public distribution system. What Rajiv Gandhi did was to identify 29 subjects which were put into the 11th schedule of the Constitution as an illustrative list of the kind of subjects that could be devolved to the lower level. And how did he choose those 29 subjects? By saying that obviously relations with Bhutan or relations with Pakistan or relations with China can't be divide, can't, cannot be decided at the village level. That is something which has to be reserved for the center. But things like drinking water, things like drains, things like small minor irrigation, things like running <coughs> the fair price shops, why should this be done <coughs> by officials at a higher level? Why can't we leave it to the villagers to manage these things themselves? to plan these things themselves, to themselves determine what will be their own responsibility for neighborhood problems, for the community, for the village. And then you leave it to them. Some will be more competent than others, but all will be more competent than a distant district administration, <coughs> which is run by the politicians at the state capital or the central, run by the MPs and the MLAs in their own interest, and which distance themselves from the people. We have to make people feel that this is their government. What they feel now is that, yes, we've elected our government, but it's not our government. We've elected the government, and all we can do is wait for five years and kick the scoundrels out. That revenge politics has become election politics. Because what they need is not being delivered. But if you lowered it, and you said that it is the local landlord who has been elected as the president, and he's going to suffer the humiliation of being defeated in the next election, the chances are that he'll put his best foot forward to ensure that the people are happy with his performance. 
And it is on this principle that we can secure a larger measure of gross national happiness for the larger share of our population. Whatever G and H we have in India is cornered by a small elite. This is also true of the GDP, leave alone the G and H. It is the well-off who secure much or most of the benefits of development. And what change is left is converted into welfare programs which are then flung at the people. And perceiving this problem in a private conversation with me, Rajiv Gandhi said, when I asked him, why are you so keen on this Panchayat Raj? He replied, because I'm terrified of these young men in tight pants. This seemed to me to be an extraordinary response that because there are young men walking around in tight pants, that therefore we must have Panchayat Raj. So I asked him what was the connection. And he said that his mother, who was the former Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, would in the mornings hold what she called a darshan, that anybody could come into her house and stand in the lawns, and she would then go past them at about 7 o'clock in the morning collecting petitions of, from people who had grievances with a view to trying to settle them. And Rajiv said, I'd sometimes go behind mummy to watch how this process happened. And he'd say, I'd see this man, middle-aged, perhaps even old, definitely poor, in a very dirty dhoti, clutching his petition in his sweaty hands, and waiting for the Prime Minister to come up to him. And when she did, he would hand over the petition to her. She would briefly look at it, pass it on to R.K. Dhavan, who was walking behind her, his secretary. And then exchanging a few words, she'd pass on. And he said, looking at that peasant's face, I find it suffused with happiness. And he said, I th always thought it was curious that he should look so happy, because surely he knew that nothing was going to happen with that petition. And she knows also that nothing is going to happen with this petition. And he knows that she knows, and she knows that he knows. And yet he's feeling very happy. Why? He says he's feeling very happy because in that generation, all they were seeking was sunwai, a hearing. And he said to himself, here is this great woman, the Prime Minister of India, and she has stopped to share my sorrow with me. Even if nothing happens, look what a great woman she is, that she has borne my burden on her shoulders for a few minutes, and even if she can't do anything very much about it, at least she's given me a hearing. And Rajiv said that the son of this chap has been given some education, generally a bad education. And the first thing he does is to throw away the dhoti and put on the tight pants. And he says then every afternoon, wearing these tight pants, he goes along with his friends to the cinema to watch the matinee show. And then he comes out of the cinema and stands with a cigarette dangling from his lower lip to whistle at the girls who are passing by. And when he gets tired of whistling at the girls who are passing by, he and his friends go into the local tea shop and order one cup of tea, which they pour into the saucer. And the saucer then moves from one hand to another and the leader of this group, in his tight pants, throws one leg over the another leg and says, you know, this bloody prime minister of ours, he doesn't know a thing. And Rajiv said, you know, he's right. I can't do a thing. So that is where the dissatisfaction is. 
that we've educated him enough for him to learn that the elected representative is not a feudal representative, that is not because of birth that he is where he is, but that because you have elected him, he is where he is. And if he ignores you for five years, revenge is in your hand. And he said, what do I do with this boy with tight pants? And he said, the answer is to put him in charge of his village. Say that you can stand for election at the age of 21. Ask him to take the responsibility for running the village. Give him the means for doing so. And then make his, cons his criticism constructive. Let him realize what are the problems of development, what are the problems of welfare, how does one make the administration responsive so that people say, like that old man did, that even if the prime minister can do nothing for me, at least she's given her ear to me. She's listened to what I have to say. At a minimum, let that boy learn that he first has to win the confidence of the people and do his best to serve them. And at that point, he said, we'll save our democracy. Because, said Rajiv, if election after election, the government is changed and the whole process becomes a process of vengeance, then somebody will come along and say the problem is democracy. Let's throw away this democracy, give me the responsibility, and I will lead you forward. As Mussolini said, as Hitler said, as Franco said, as no end of dictators around the country have said. <coughs> so he said, if our biggest achievement has been democracy, then our biggest failure has been our failure to take that democracy from the top echelons, from parliament, to the grassroots. And if we put it in at the grassroots and genuinely empower the people to look after their own lives, to look after what matters to them, for somebody to be able to say that if the teacher does not turn up in school, whom can you complain to today? But if you put the school system under the panchayats, then all he or she has to do is to walk up to the president of the panchayat and say, what kind of a teacher have you employed? He's not even turning up to teach. To go to the president of the panchayat and say, whom have you appointed as the doctor here? He hasn't, the compounder has not come to work. The dai is not there and my wife is pregnant. The medicines are not available. The compounder is not there to be able to make up the medicines. Where do you complain today? You can only complain if the authority concerned is on the next street or around the corner. That you open your tap and no water comes out. And you look at your drain, it's clogged, no water goes out. Whom can you complain to today? You can go to the BDO if you want, the block development officer, but he'll just sneer at you. He says, don't you think I've got other work to do than look after your stupid tap and your silly drain, clean it yourself and live without water or go and get it from the well. That is the dissatisfaction with the system. It's not big policy. It's the neighborhood issues, the family issues, the household issues. And for this, they have to have a sense of empowerment. And one day, I learned my lesson. This was, alas, after Rajiv had left. But I think he would enjoy listening to it if ever I meet up with him again. I was rounding off my, one of my village visits in my constituency. It was about 11 o'clock at night. I'd finished with the village meeting. And I was getting into my car to drive overnight to Madras Airport to catch the flight back to Delhi. When I saw a little boy, seven or eight years old, clutching onto his elder sister's arm and walking towards me. So I waited for the boy to come up to me. And he, imitating the elders at this village meeting, he said to me, Uncle, can I ask you a question? 
So I said, yeah, sure. What's the question? He said, uncle, I want to study. So I said, what's the problem? Don't you have a school here? And he pointed to the building in front of which I had held my village meeting and said, that's our school. So I said, they haven't admitted you. I looked a little bewildered and said, yes, I've been admitted. So I said, the problem is the textbooks. They're charging you for them. He said, no, I get my textbooks for free. I said, aha, the problem is the midday meal. At which point he suddenly beamed. And he says, no, uncle, the food I get at school is much better than what I get at home. So I said to him, you have a school, you've been admitted, you get your textbooks for free. You just told me that the food you get at school is better than you get at home. So what do you mean I want to study? And the boy said, uncle, I'd like a teacher. You see where the problem is? Under our Sarvasiksha Abhyan, the Education for All movement, every village is now getting school buildings getting classrooms, getting blackboards, getting compound walls, getting playing fields, getting toilets, getting toilets for girls. Enrollment rates are going up. Dropout rates are going down. Girls are entering school almost in the same numbers as the boys. But what are schools for? Are schools for toilets? Are schools for classrooms? Are schools for blackboards? Or are schools for learning? And when you look at the learning outcomes, the results are disastrous. We have what is called an annual survey of education report, ASER. And for years, the ASER have been telling us that nearly half of our class seven students between 43 and 47 percent, cannot read a class two text. That they can't do simple addition and subtraction, leave alone multiplication and division. So the children are going to school, and the best teachers are saying, if I don't go to the classroom, then the most ambitious parents are going to send the children to me for tuition and thereby I can double or triple my salary. So we have a system which is excellent on hardware, but has fallen on its face on software because government teachers are the single largest body of civil servants we have in India. And they are under the control of the minister. And the minister will decide whether they remain there or whether they'll be moved. So all our teachers are looking over their shoulders towards the minister to be responsible to him. None of them is looking down towards the village, towards the village families, towards the children of the village to sort out his responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis that child. And we've established school management committees which have one or two parents in it and one president of the village panchayat and the rest is run, the management committee consists of the very same civil servants who are supposed to run the system. So they certify themselves as excellent and send it up to the minister. And in the meanwhile, the results on the ground are pathetic and we're not getting what we want. Now if Rajiv had been here, maybe this would have been corrected. And maybe the responsibility for recruiting teachers ensuring their discipline, dismissing them if they are not up to the mark, would have lain with the local authority. The reason why private schools, despite the fees they charge, are becoming increasingly popular is because at least each school is run by a parent-teacher association. And they'd never pay the fees if the teachers were not to be present. But in government schools, there is no supervision. There is no management. And my daughter, who made a special study of all this, she found that of the funds made available through the Sarvasiksha Abhyan, which is the Education for All campaign, only 6% of the money reached the school management committees. 
So the only thing they can do with this small amount of money is to whitewash the school every year. So you go into any Indian village, the best whitewashed building is the school building. But is it for whitewashing walls that we want an education campaign? It can't be run by the bureaucracy. It has to be run by the people. The child development services, the national health service, all these have to be run by the people themselves for their own welfare. With assistance from the government in terms of money, that is the second F, finances, and in terms of functionaries being told you work for the panchayat, you don't sit on top of them. And a clear delineation of functions. So that's the way in which one will be able to realize the dream. It's now 23 years since the amendments to the Constitution were brought into force. I had once asked Rajiv Gandhi how long he thought it would take for effective Panchayat Raj to come to the country. Rajiv said at least a generation, that is 25 years. We're almost at 25 years. Panchayati Raj has been made ineluctable, irremovable, irreversible. We have to have panchayat institutions everywhere. But how effective they are, it varies so much from state to state. And since I'm speaking to an audience from a country that has a lot of hills, which then become a lot of mountains, let me share with you the good news. That all over the world, the experience is that the best local government starts most quickly in hill country and mountain country. And the reason for this, if you think about it, why is Norway number one in the world in local self-government? Why in India is Sikkim such an outstanding performer, as is Himachal Pradesh? It's because the central government can't reach the village. <laughs> and so the village is best equipped to rule itself. So you have a great future ahead of you, so long as you keep your villages isolated and give them the authority to run their own affairs and limit the functions of the central government and of the central parliament to what <coughs> the center alone is capable of doing or is best capable of doing. And everything else on the principle of subsidiarity, which says that whatever can be done at a lower level should be done at that level and not at a higher level. And its counterpart, that whatever can best be done at a higher level should be done at that higher level and at no lower level. On this principle of subsidiarity, if we organize the governance of a relatively small country like Bhutan or a relatively huge country like India, I think we'd both be better off. Thank you for giving me this golden opportunity. I thank your majesty.